What's up guys, EDA Talk Sports here, back with another video. This time we're going to be reviewing this weekend's Premier League fixtures. And guys, we have a lot to talk about. Let's bring it up right here. Oh, where do we start? We're going to start at the top with Arsenal versus Brighton, that being the first fixture of this weekend. And uh, watching that fixture, obviously being an Arsenal fan, it was one that I was going into the game thinking, you know, Brighton have won their first two games against Everton, against Man United. They're going to be a formidable team. I, going into the season and predicting, underrated them, foolishly so, to be honest with you. But I knew it was going to be a tough game, a game that Arsenal could easily lose, easily draw, easily win. Because we've seen those kind of happen over the last couple of years. Going into the game and watching the game and as it progressed, it was very competitive. As you can see, we'll look at the momentum and we'll look at the key fixtures. Everett scoring in the 38th minute. I believe Arsenal um, kind of not deserved that lead, but I think they put themselves in a position to, to score, put themselves in a position to be threatening. There were opportunities for Saka, Odegaard, Havertz themselves where they were getting in positions and they were threatening. And in the first half, they were the more kind of dominant team and had the best opportunities. And Havertz getting his goal was really, really impressive. Dunk making a mistake in the back. Uh, Arsenal working the ball back Saka finding Havertz and Havertz with a brilliant finish and the finish that has kind of been forgotten Havertz in the striker role is putting up incredible numbers he mentioned before the game started he wants to get 20 Premier League goals this season he's in position to do so starting the season with two um, and it's something that needs to continue with Saka finding him Odegaard finding him we will go into individual performances obviously but we go into the half competitive game Looks like Arsenal are in control for the most part. Brighton are threatening, are dangerous, obviously. We go into the second half and I'm going to be really, really honest with you watching the incident. So, and I think you know the one I'm talking about, Declan Rice getting sent off. Now, that's the incident that changed the entire game. Declan Rice getting sent off was, for me, a ridiculous decision made by Chris Kavanagh, who, from an, just being objective, watching the game, I think he had a poor performance. Uh, Brighton left back should have been booked early in the game. He was struggling with Saka. Dal Pedro kicked the ball out of play uh, after it had ran out. And so when you look at Declan Rice getting sent off with his incident with Veltman, you can see the frustration with both players. That's nothing new. If you've ever played football before, again, you've seen that. But what I don't agree with, again, is Veltman's not looking to play the ball. Let's be honest. Let's be realistic with each other. He's not looking to play the ball. He's angry. He sees Declan Rice is slightly nudge the ball. He's, gonna, he's got plausible deniability to do what he wants to do. Declan Rice, slightly frustrated, taps the ball away and gets whacked in the leg. And, you know, he he, he makes sure it's known. Then moves, tries to move past it and says, let's, let's continue. The Brighton players are calling for a, a second yellow card. Chris Kavanaugh makes the decision to change the game on, on that. If you're looking at the law of the game, the ball is still rolling, it's still moving. You can't restart play like that. Uh, Chris Kavanaugh is, hasn't taken that into regard. He hasn't chosen to use a decision which requires common sense. And that decision ultimately led to Arsenal losing complete control of that game. Uh, they held opportunities, they have that opportunity where he kind of creates that out of nothing. Then the cross that Havertz makes for Saka and Saka gets a touch on it, but not enough to put in the back of the net. And those were big opportunities, which you can see listed. But uh, the goal from Jao Pedro after the sending off was the one that kind of put the nail in Arsenal's coffin. They had to bring on uh, Calafiori, as you can see. And we look through events during the game. That goal shifted Arsenal's approach completely. Um, you know, less than 10 minutes after that red card, they conceded and they had to not only kind of, it wasn't a whole kind of hanging on for the draw because Arsenal did want to win. However, there was a lot of, you know, we'll take what we, we've got against a tough team. And again, disappointing for Arsenal as we look through the performances. Again, I don't think Zach Rice deserves to get sent off. It was, you know, he shouldn't have, have nudged the ball, but Let's use common sense here. Let's be practical about the game. And Veltman knew what he was doing. He wasn't looking to play the ball. That was violent conduct to a deg degree, if you want to call it that as well. So again, referee, bring control, bring an element of sensibility to the game. You don't change a game based on a decision like that, in my opinion. I want to talk about some something outside of that. Kai Havertz continues to shine. Saka continues to shine. I'm going to need more from guard, if I'm going to be honest with you. Captain, we, we need a lot more. Thomas Partey, again, need a little bit more in his midfield performances. Arsenal 
again you can't really judge them wholeheartedly they were looking in control they were looking competitive in the game against the team which have always caused them trouble so you can only kind of judge on what i've seen in that they were looking strong in a game against a really top team Brighton responded well, were competitive. As we've mentioned, Jao Pedro shines again. Uh, Matoma was dangerous once again. He started the season really, really well. Minter not to the same degree and uh, Dingra came off the bench. And, uh, you know, it'd be good to see uh, Dingra get a bit more game time, but these two seem to be the preferred wingers. James Milner went off early in the game. I think Dunk and Van Henker I want to talk about as two players who have really, really performed really well. Enzo Wood, which we spoke about previously, had a bit of a tough time. But, um, yeah, Arsenal are going to need to bounce back after this international break against Tottenham. Brighton, again, are in a good position. They deserve to be where they are. We'll cover the table. But, again, I think that this game changed on that refereeing decision and that's where it's really disappointing. The next game we're going to be covering is Brentford versus Southampton. And what can you say? The combination of Imbrema and Wissa is... It's magical. I mean, what can you say about it? The way they play, it feels old school. It feels like they've established that this is their new evolution after moving away from Tony. And it's been that way for, you know, a season or so with the betting man and Tony falling out of favour because Brentford know they have to move him on. And Southampton obviously have started the season in the best vein of form, but Brentford continue to, you know, establish themselves in the season. And you've you got to be impressed by, by what they've done. They may have less of the ball during the game, but they know how to create opportunities and they know how to be threatening on the counter and defensively solid. And they, they don't concede often uh, this season. And normally they don't. I think they had a couple of seasons last season being a blip for them. But if Mbremo and Wissa can continue to do what they're doing, you're looking at you know two players who could potentially move on in move on in the future, especially when you talk about Embremo. He's you know been been scouted by many of the top four teams, and you know he's continued to impress. He's been a force this season, and you have to be worried for Southampton. I honestly don't believe they have enough strength. I think they need a lot more, and they'd be troublesome. Yes, but it's not enough to be troublesome. You have to actually have a threat. You have to either be defensively solid or have something going forward, and they have neither. In my opinion, they don't have anyone who's going to get them a, a bag load of goals and they don't have anyone who's going to, you know, make sure that they don't concede. So I'm really worried for Southampton. They're going to need to produce something. The transfer window is closed and so we'll see where they go. But they are, you know, one of the big favourites to go down. Next game, we're going to be covering Everton versus Bournemouth. And, oh, my goodness, what a game. So I, I, I didn't actually get to watch this. I've obviously seen the highlights. Seeing Everton 2 new up, I was thinking, you know, OK, the Goodison crowd, are back we've seen what we need to see from a you know disappointing start from the season you know losing to Brighton and then losing once again Everton will be back they're, they're here to perform and yeah it went bad it went really really bad I can't imagine being at that game as an Everton fan or as a Bournemouth fan being 2-0 up uh, one goal from from Keane and another goal from Calvert-Lewin it would look like Everton were going to get their first three points of the season they were, you know, in large parts dominating the game from all you could see. But they, they seemed to just stumble and they seemed to lose a lot of their strength later in the game. And three quick fire goals to end the game were, you know, maybe their downfall. Did they may probably make a substitution that they didn't need to? Those are the questions you've got to answer. Uh, from a uh, Sean Dyche perspective, however, from a Bournemouth perspective, this is three points which you probably weren't expecting 60, 70 probably 80 minutes into the game. However, they pull it out. And one thing about Bournemouth, even though they've lost Blanky and Evan Nielsen, probably didn't have the best game. They've got a plethora of players behind there, Semenya, Cliver, Tavernier, who can cause a whole host of problems. And so with the way they play, with the way Ariola coaches his teams and kind of keeps that mentality going, um, it's really good to see that they, they came out of there. But the real question I have, is what's happening with Everton. They need to keep goals out. Their defence was their calling card last season. They are looking very, very leaky this season. And the defence, when you look at it, doesn't strike any fear into anybody. There's no one who I would say is an outstanding defender. No, no, you know, uh, disrespect to Tarkovsky, but on the wings, they look weak. Um, you know, from a kind of wing-back perspective, in the middle, they don't look strong. That, that back four doesn't scare me. 
and it doesn't scare a lot of the opposition players in the Premier League. So a lot to look at from both teams, but we'll see where they go. Next up, we have Ipswich versus Fulham, two teams who have started the season in different form. Obviously, Ipswich have two really hard games, lost them both, Man City and Liverpool at home. Man City away was a wake-up call for them. They got the early goal and then realised who they're going up against. <laughs> Eric Erling Haaland doing the job once again. Uh, Fulham replied from a Liam D. lap open off with Adama Chore getting the goal. And I think both teams will be content with the point. Ipswich getting their first point. Fulham continuing to build on what they've done previously. It's been, I think, a win, a draw and a loss for Fulham. So, again, they won't be overly disappointed with what they've done. Uh, this kind of thing I want to call out is both left-backs, two star players for their team, Davis and Robinson. They assist for both goals and it's great to see a dearth of left-backs who are, who are continuing to perform in the Premier League because I've, at some point, at one point, there was really a, literally a gap in the league of quality left-backs. But we've seen two teams at the mid-table level relegation battle with two quality players and so it's good to see that the quality level is rising uh, in the Premier League continuously season on season year. I think uh, Liam Delap is one I want to call out again. I think he's got a lot of quality. The son of Rory Delap, like him as a signing, obviously went through the Man City ranks and scored goals for fun and hopefully he's going to do that in the Premier League building on the season. I, set, I think I set the range for him between, you know, I'd like to see him hit 10 or above. 10 to 12, obviously, it's his first season. He's young. I wouldn't put anything unrealistic upon him, but he has the quality and he has the potential to do so. Moving on to our next game, Nottingham Forest versus Wolves. Again, two teams who have done really well. Nottingham Forest, who have surprised. Wolves, who I think they've performed better than their results have suggested. But again, two losses are two losses. Going into this game, they needed something and they got something. Chris Wood with the opener has been consistent for them and, and has shined since solidifying that starting Rackle was his own. Obviously, not in the forest. We're looking for a striker in the transfer window. Weren't able to lock anybody down. Uh, so they're going to hope that Chris Wood is going to be firing alongside the likes of Hudson Odoi and Alanga. For Wolves, they replied in instant fashion from Bellegard, uh, who received an assist from Mario Lamina. And Lamina was really, really good in this game. Uh, watching the highlights, he really impressed me. And this is the Lamina that we've, we've wanted to see for quite a long while. Not the Forest, though, is who I want to talk about. They have a team where they've you know, signed loads of players, but I think they're forming themselves. And Nuno has done a great job in forming the team and isolating who's where. And uh, I think that's really something that they, they've got. They've got quality kind of all across the pitch. Even their centre-backs, uh, Rillo and Milenkovic, are two really, really good players. And I think they've got a foundation to do something to move away from that relegation battle. It's early in the season and we should see, but Alanga, hudson Odoi, Gibbs-White... And Chris Wood should be a, a strike partnership that should cause a little bit of trouble. And I think if they can add some more firepower off the bench, they should have a lot of joy. Larson and Cunha, again, a combination that seems to be continuously in growing. Obviously, Cunha is a player who performed really well last season, despite the injuries that he had. Larson new into the league. They're going to need both of those players firing and opening that the style that they've established under Gary O'Neill is one that will take them very, very far. Next up, West Ham versus Man City. And guys, Erling Haaland, what can you say? Absolute domination. The boy is a star. I'm not going to cover this in great diesel because, you know, in a solid effort, yes. But this was domination. This was Man City at their best. Um, completely like, I'm making this game look like a home game, an easy game, a, a walk in the park. And again, West Ham put up a, a good effort. But let's be honest with you, there was only one team who came to who looked like they actually believed that they were going to win, and that was Man City. Erling Haaland doing what he does best. Another hat-trick. He's a machine, and he's probably won another golden boot. Being in this team, being an absolute machine, and, you know, resulting. So, Man City, where their biggest rivals, Arsenal's failed this weekend, they, they shine, and they were able to get the victory, and that's the difference between champion and challenger. Next up, Chelsea versus Crystal Palace. I mean... From Chelsea's perspective, this is a game that they really should have won. The opening goal from Nico Jackson, I love Nico, to be honest with you. He's just in the position to be receiving a new deal from Chelsea. I think he surprised a lot of people. Seeing him coming from Villarreal was one who really likes his game. From everything I saw, you know, he's raw, yes, but he's a maverick. I'll say it again. He's someone who can frustrate so much, but I think the quality is there and I think... He will continue to show that. Whether it be as a starting striker for Chelsea, I don't know. They've got many options on how they can improve and who they can go with. But I like Nico a lot. And I think he has an all-round game which can benefit a team like Chelsea for sure. But the equaliser came from Eze and 
I wouldn't say it wasn't a justified equaliser because Crystal Palace kept themselves in the game, but there's opportunities and times within this game where Crystal Palace could have potentially been down to 10 men with Will Hughes getting into some situations where, you know, looking at the game, you'll be thinking, he should have been sent off. This is like two tackles, pull back, and he still stayed on. So you couldn't help but feel like, you know, if you're a Aussie fan, you feel a little bit hard done by. However, the goal from Eze was absolutely a brilliant, uh, showed his quality, showed why he's been sought after by all these top six teams. He has the quality, he has the ability, and it's going to be a hard one for him this season. Obviously, the addition of Inketia will support the team and will benefit them. However, they're probably going to need a lot more firepower, and it seems if they can't stay defensively solid, they're going to have a lot of problems. Next up into our penultimate game, Newcastle versus Tottenham. And it was a brilliant performance uh, from Spurs. I mean, apart from the fact they can't finish their chances. Wasteful, wasteful, wasteful. Same story that we saw last season. Spurs will play brilliant all the way up into the box. Their problem is box to box. They can't keep people out and they can't finish consistently. And that's where they need to improve. Because in between, they play some of the best football in the league. When they're in complete flow, they play brilliant football. I'm an Arsenal fan, so it's, it's, it's difficult for me to say this. Actually, not really. I'm, I can talk about football quite unbiasedly. So when I look at them, and I know Ainge, I've watched all his games with Celtic, I knew that he would come in and play some brilliant football. What I wasn't aware of is how poor they would be from box to box. And that needs to improve. Spurs won't get top four, and that's why I didn't predict them. If they can't keep people out and they can't finish their chances. If they finish their chances, I'm telling you, they would be a top four team with ease. If they fix their defence, they will be a top three, top two. I'm not even joking. But those are two critical areas. You can't keep people out, you're not going to climb the table. You can't score, you're not going to climb the table. And that's two things that they need to really, really work on. For Newcastle, again, you could say they got a little bit lucky. They got dominated at home to a degree. However, they stuck in the game. They knew that as the game wears on, Tottenham seemed to get weaker and weaker and they showed out. And when you've got players like Isaac, when you've got players like Barnes, when you've got players like Gordon up front, they can cause you problems throughout the game. And yeah, to continue their great form, I believe unbeaten for the season, two wins and a draw, if I'm not mistaken. And they continue to fire on strongly. Spurs, on the other hand, will be going into the North London derby on the back of a loss, but they'll be at home and we'll be hoping that they can stay defensively solid. I look at the defence and I'll be honest with you, it doesn't strike fear into my heart. It does absolutely nothing. So they're going to need to improve then and they're going to need to get a lot better. To our final game, we've got Manchester United versus Liverpool. And simply put, guys, this was men versus boys. This was a manager who knows what he's doing versus a manager who doesn't. I'm not going to sugarcoat it with Eric Ten Hag. You know, when he was there, I said, if he does this and if he does that, he can revive this team. There's no revival for him, in my opinion. And I may be wrong. And if I am, we'll come back to this video and we'll say, listen, I was talking absolute crap. However, looking at him, his team, through all games this season, they look void of ideas. They look void of creativity. I watch them and I'm actually bored. Like, not even as like a rival fan. I'm just, it's boring. They offer nothing. They don't seem to have a plan. Even if they were, you know, old school Jose, which his teams were actually quite exciting. But if they were sitting in the back, parking the bus, at least they would show a strategy. I don't know what Man United are trying to do. At home, they had a little bit more possession. They had their high expected goals, but that all came later in the game. They were dominated. Salah destroyed them. So did Diaz, who were two really imp impressive performers from a Liverpool standpoint. And their midfield had an easy day as they could possibly have. The combination of Bruno, Casemiro and Manu wasn't good enough. The centre-backs were absolutely atrocious. I'm not going to talk about Onana again. Again, it was so poor. I put a lot of what Man United need to do is they need a change of approach. For me, you need to get a midfield three in place. If that means you know, working harder from a right centre mid position, then, then so be it. You need to figure out what you're going to do with Xerxes. Is he going to continue to start for you? What's his position? When? What's going to happen? Hoyland comes back into the team. Should Rashford still be starting? Again, there's decisions that need to be made and I think they need to be made quite quickly. It was an absolutely atrocious performance for Man United. And it's indicative of what we've seen previously. Liverpool are absolute fire. Last season, I gave them all the respect in the world and Klopp's final season. But to me, right now, this could be, I don't know, potentially an even better team. A team that I saw under Klopp got a lot of last-minute winners, showed heart, showed fire, showed desire. This team seems to be defensively sound, know what they're doing, being strong and structured, as well as being exciting on the counter. 
is taken into consideration and they do it really, really well. So a lot of congratulations to Liverpool. They are going to be in the battle for their uh, title. They're going to put pressure on Arsenal and Man City for how long is yet to be determined. But I do think they're going to be a problem for both teams again this season. Looking at the Premier League table, finally, just to cover us up, Man City and Liverpool sit atop two teams who are unbeaten, who are 100% throughout this uh, season so far. But leave them, they've got Brighton, Arsenal, Newcastle and Brentford and Aston Villa as the teams who are continuously keeping up the pace. Uh, following on from that, Bournemouth and Nottingham Forest, again, two teams who have done really well and have yet to lose this season. Two teams who should be really concerned. Everton and Southampton yet to pick up a point. Not good enough. And I would be worried about both teams. Everton, especially because what is going on with their defence? Honestly, not good enough. Wolves, Ipswich, Crystal Palace and Leicester are another couple of teams who will be worried as well as Man United who have only achieved three points this season. Guys, I will catch you very, very soon. Be sure to leave a like, subscribe and comment of your game of the weekend, your best perform of the weekend and I will catch you guys soon.